it's great to be here with you. Uh, my uh, history is, uh, as Phil said, 34 years in health systems. I decided when I finished at Ohio State in the 70s that I wanted to focus my career in integrated health systems because I believe that was the model on a regional basis that made sense to me. So I went to work in the Greenville Hospital System in Greenville, South Carolina and spent seven years there in, in, develop, in working with Bob Toomey, a gentleman who really is considered the father of the regional multi-hospital system concept. So uh, I, I'm now working with Premier. I also do work in Washington uh, uh, with Seth and with other folks. I've helped set up a national association of a hospital-owned health plan organization called HHP in Washington. So I do that part-time and then I do this with Premier uh, a good bit. This is my 20th uh, accountable care organization assessment across the country. So I've been in 20 other communities. We'll show you those communities here in a minute. So if you have physician colleagues, you can always call them and say, okay, tell us about what's going on in your community, because I really encourage people to do that, because not every community is the same, believe me. I think every community is different, but you'll see some of the communities that we're working in right now, which is about 75 or 80 communities in the United States uh, across the country that we do work helping people get ready for uh, really health reform and accountable care organizations. Uh, and, and so what I'd like to do is, is really focus first a little bit on, on reform very quickly, Seth, if we can go ahead. You know, what, what, the, what the federal government strategy is, I think, is to, is to change the current system and make it um, a little more, uh, uh, l less, uh, <laughs> l less advantageous to all of us, all of us in hospitals and physicians, kind of motivate us to change. And then they're creating this new model, this accountable care organization model, and they're trying to make it look and, and appear more appealing to us. And, and I think that's their strategy right now. So, so we kind of call it two tracks. One track, FFS, is fee for service. So there's cuts in fee for service for all of us, hospitals, physicians, in the bill over the next few years. And then second, they're trying to create these new payment models that disrupt the current payment model. And so when I'm in Washington, I, I would tell you the three themes that I hear over and over and over, and it doesn't matter if the person works for a Democrat or Republican or independent or libertarian, what I hear are three things over and over. The first is we want to break down the silos that exist in healthcare, that, that healthcare in the United States is developed in silos and there's a lack of integration across the delivery system between primary care doctors, specialists, hospitals, and if you think about it, medical information uh, is not shared uh, like, it, like they would like it to see. So that's number one. The second is they want to move away from uh, what we call uh, volume. Volume incentives and move to value. So value over volume is the theory. Value being pay people more for doing a good job of keeping people healthy and for providing high quality care at a, at a, at a lower cost instead of incentives to do more volume, to do more admissions, to do more procedures. Because if you look at the United States compared to the rest of the world, we do about double the procedures, it doesn't matter in what area, than the rest of the world. And there's no difference in our health outcomes. No, we're not better. That's what's amazing. In some cases, it's actually worse. And I don't know how many of you have read the article by Atul Gawande uh, that was written about a year and a half ago. Dr. Gawande from Harvard wrote an article, and I know Atul, uh, about uh, overutilization. And he compared El Paso, Texas's use rates to McAllen, Texas. Are you familiar with that article? If you've not, it's in the New Yorker. It's a great article. I'm sure Alan will, will, will get it for you. But Dr. Gawande really po pointed out the, the dra tremendous difference in, in utilization between two cities. And, and, uh, and, and, and not saying necessarily why it happened, but uh, pointing out that their outcomes, their quality outcomes, are worse in McAllen, where they spend uh, a lot more money. McAllen's one of the most highest spending Medicare communities in the United States. They spend $15,000 per capita on Medicare in McAllen, Texas, versus here, you guys spend about $8,400 per capita on me each Medicare recipient <coughs> in, in the Naples area, okay? The national average is $7,800, just to give you a little bit of a, a difference <coughs> of how you fit on that. The lowest cost city in America is Honolulu, $5,400. Minneapolis is about 6,000. Miami, Florida is 16,000. So if you, you, you look at it, it's, it's triple. Think about 
Uh, Honolulu at 5,400, Miami at $16,000 per Medicare recipient. But even look at look at look at your city, Na Naples versus Miami. They're not that far apart, and you know you've got Mi uh, Miami basically spending twice as much than you do here in Naples per Medicare recipient. And and you know uh, one of the things I, I I tried to I always try to study this. It's called the Dartmouth Atlas is the research. And uh, I remember one of our cardiologists in, in Asheville, I was talking to him about it, I was talking to Bill Hathaway, and, B and I said to Bill, I said, Bill, why do, you th why do you think that's true? And he said, well, Joe, let me tell you a story. He said, uh, you know, we have, we're a cardiology group here in Asheville. We see a lot of patients who spend the summer in Asheville and the winter in Miami. And he said, let me tell you the observation I have. I have a 72-year-old healthy patient, well, he's as healthy as you and I are, and he gets stress tests quarterly from his cardiologist in Miami. And, and, and that's the story he told me. He said, their utilization patterns there are unbelievable compared to what the norm is, okay? And so, and so that's the kind of thing that, that, that this reform really wants to attack. They're saying, well, why, why do we have this such tremendous variance? And why are some people getting stress tests quarterly? <laughs> you know, it doesn't make sense, okay? And, and so that's why this is being developed. So if we could go on to the next slide. Uh, the, the, this slide is, you know, it's, it's very busy. And, and what, what it shows is these are the steps in the year that each of the reform efforts will be implemented, okay? And, and I'll just try to point out a couple of them because I want to leave a lot of time for questions. I don't want to take too much time uh, going through all these slides, but, uh, you know, these are the payment costs and the additional tax provisions in the first set of, uh, of the bill. And, and you could see there's a new tax starting for pharmaceuticals, a, a new tax for medical devices that start in 2013. That's the new revenue. And then there's cuts. Uh, hospital cuts have already started. So uh, Phil and Alan are very familiar with the, the behavioral offset cut that's already occurred. And then, of course, the market basket reductions have started. So what that basically means is hospitals are going to be paid less than inflation in any increase in the future years. So, so that reduction has already started in 2010 and will continue uh, through the next five years. Uh, the second set are pay for performance. Uh, and, and what we're talking about there is, is really taking money away from hospitals for poor performance. So for example, uh, if re readmissions occur uh, and, and hospital acquired infections occur, hospitals will not be paid for readmissions within 30 days for certain conditions such as congestive heart failure. Uh, an example that I, that I gave the group is uh, nationally, 30% uh, of all people who transferred from a nursing home to a hospital are readmitted within 30 days. So th think about that for a second. And you will not be paid starting in uh, 2013 or October of 2012 for those readmissions, okay? And, and think about the fact, does the hospital really have control over the quality of care at the nursing home? We really don't. So how can we influence that? So we're trying to think through what are the strategies we can take to try to minimize uh, those readmissions. So, so you, can, you can see these are all the changes and, and ACOs uh, are, are down here under the delivery system provisions. And uh, what, what's happening on the ACO circuit right now is they're developing a set of rules right now. And those rules are being uh, led by a couple of physicians, uh, Don Berwick, of course, who's a pediatrician uh, from Boston, and Rick Gilfillan, who's a family physician who was at uh, Geisinger. Uh, and both of those gentlemen happen to be people I've worked with. Uh, in fact, Rick Gilfillan, who's now uh, the, the leader, the co-chair of the group to develop the ACO rules, was with us at Premier. And I worked with Rick and Seth worked with Rick to develop this process that we use here. So. Um, so the accountable care organization, the rules are, the specific rules were originally supposed to be distributed nationally in September, but Rick Gilfillan, who worked with us, left us in August and joined CMS, Dr. Gilfillan. And, and so because of that, I think one of the reasons was delaying the development of those rules so that Rick could kind of, you know, have an opportunity to influence where those rules are going. Uh, and, and, then, and then there's also some, ver they found some very difficult issues, and I'll share one of them with you that has not been resolved yet, uh, it, that is, is very important. Um, this slide, I call, I call this my Doubting Thomas slide. Uh, I think it's a great slide because to me, it doesn't matter whether you're 
uh, whether the Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians, Independents control Washington right now, it doesn't matter because they all look at this slide and say, we got a big problem in this country right now. We have to do something different, okay? We cannot afford to keep doing health care the way we're doing it. Let me show you this slide real quickly. Uh, on the left side is the gross domestic product, and these are only federal expenditures for health care, okay? The federal expenditures for health care only. Okay, so down the left side is the GDP, on the bottom is the year, and of course this is the growth curve. And you can see we're currently running at a growth curve of federal expenditures for health care, 2.5% percentage points faster than the growth of the overall GDP. The overall GDP is growing about 2%, health care federal expenditures are growing at 4.5%, right? That's what's happening in 2009, 2010. So, so what they've done is they've said, okay, if this continues, Here's what happens to health care expenditures at the federal level. Well, all of us in this room pay about a 35% federal tax rate, right? I mean, everybody with me? We all pay about, you know, give, a, give or take a couple on the federal level. Now, we have other taxes on top of that, but a federal tax of about 35%. And, and what they've projected, they said, okay, Joe, to fund this, we have to go to a 92% effective federal tax rate for all of us by 2050 if this curve continues, okay? So what they've said is, and, and you know, a lot of people say, Joe, I don't have to worry about this. I'm gonna be dead before 2050, but our kids will have to worry about this. Second, uh, in about 2020, we'll go over 50% tax rate for all of us. And I, don't, and, and I don't think any of us wanna see that happen, and I don't think the American public really has the stomach to pay a 92% tax rate or even a 50% tax rate. So, so this is the trend line. And what, what the federal government has said, you know what? Best case, with, with the baby boomer growth, best case we think we can get to a 1% growth rate above the GDP. They've said we really, we don't think we can get it to a level growth rate across here, but we do think we can get it to a 1% uh, growth rate. And, and, and I was talking with uh, uh, speaker, former Speaker Nancy Pelosi, I guess, uh, her health care advisor uh, about a month ago, Wendell uh, Primus, and he said, you know what, Joe, this, th this curve is not sustainable. And he said, we've got to make a change, and we believe that ACOs are the way we're going to bend that cost curve. And I, I also met with the chief health care staff person about a month ago for the Republican caucus in the, in the House uh, Health Subcommittee, a guy named Dan Elling. And Dan, Dan said a similar thing, even though he's from the opposite party, he said, we can't afford to have this happen in the United States. And, and what I hear in Washington basically is there's three options. I can't, I've not heard of any other option. One option is ACOs to cut this. The second option is a draconian flat cut of all of us being cut, say, 10%. Hospitals, doctors, everybody. 10% cut in payment. The third option is Medicare for everybody. Okay, so that we, we implement Medicare program across the board. Now, I don't know about you, I don't like those other two options very much. So, so that's what I hear in Washington. I don't hear of any other models. In fact, I, I just met uh, about two weeks ago uh, in Chicago with one of the members of the Republican National Committee. And, and, I, and I, I asked him, I said, what's gonna happen? You know, because there's a lot of talk about repeal and replace. And he said to me, he said, he said yeah, we're, we're going to introduce a bill in January. It'll pa we believe it'll pass the House. It will not pass the Senate. It will probably won't even make it out of committee in the Senate. So you're going to hear a lot of noise about this. He said the reality is we, we understand it doesn't have a snowball's chance of passing or being approved by the president. So, so the, and, and they're calling it repeal and replace, okay? And so I asked him, I said, I understand the repeal part. What's the replace part? Now, this is two weeks ago. He said, we don't know yet. <laughs> he said, we haven't figured out how to address the cost curve. And, you know, we're, we're in caucus right now and we're trying to come up with an idea. One piece that will be in the legislation, he said, is medical liability reform. They'd like to give that a shot. The second piece that he said, uh, he said, once all this noise kind of clears, he said, this is going to take about three months, January, February, March, we'll have hearings, there'll be a lot of noise. And then he said, things will settle down. And then we're going to go after uh, kind of the funding issues. And he, and he gave an example. He said, he said basically, uh, an example of what we're going to do is, in the health care reform bill, there's an increase in uh, fraud and abuse uh, uh, review and, 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 a, and a proposal to add 16,000 IRS agents 
to help in the fraud and abuse area. And he said, he said Congress is not going to fund that. That's not going to happen. That's what he said to me. So this is only one man's uh, opinion. But I'm just giving you the feedback that I'm getting from people who are really more on the inside than I am uh, and than all of us. So, so they recognize this problem is a U.S. problem. It's not a Democratic problem, not a Republican problem. This is everybody. Any questions about this? Does this make sense to you? Are you with me? Okay. The next one, uh, you know, what is an accountable care organization? You know, there's a, I, I kind of kid, everybody's an expert in accountable care, okay? Uh, but very few people have done it. And, and, you know, in reality, I've managed health plans with 200,000 enrollees. A health plan is very similar to an accountable care organization because it's really taking responsibility or accountability for a defined population. A defined population and it's taking cost, quality, and you know, utilization and improving health status of a defined population. That's what really an accountable care organization is. And to be successful, I think, you need physicians, hospitals working together. The hospital cannot do this alone. Physicians cannot do this alone, I, I don't believe. Uh, and that's what we're seeing all over the country. And, and most communities are like you. Most communities are not like Geisinger. They're not like the Cleveland Clinic. They're not like the Mayo Clinic. They're not group practices that either own a hospital or a hospital that has a group practice. They're private practice environments. Now, so what's the model that we're seeing? The model we're seeing is a PHO model, okay? The physician hospital organization model is being used by places all over the country that have large private practice communities. And, and you're blessed. You've had a, a PHO here since 1993, so you have, a, you have an entity in place that you can use to help develop uh, an ACO, in, in my opinion. It's, it, of course, it's up to, up to the leadership here. It's not my decision, but you certainly have a vehicle in place to work together. So, so that's the model that I'm seeing across the country that organizations are either beginning to develop now or if they've had it, are using it as a vehicle to have physicians and hospitals work together to focus on accountable care. Does that make sense uh, to you all? And, and it's really uh, critical. You, you're, there's, there's not a model, I think, that can work uh, in a community like this, which is the majority, 90% of the communities look like you, which is a small, usually a small group of employed physicians and a huge number of private practice physicians. And private practice is not going to go away. Everybody is not going to be employed. I, I believe there's going to be a, a robust private practice community that will align with an ACO. And if I were in private practice, that's what I'd be doing. I would be trying to link with an organization that, that is reputable, that has a long history of stability, that has a, uh, a great reputation, a commitment to quality, a commitment to the community, uh, and also a lot of capital. Because this stuff is really complex. And, and I'm going to show you our model for assessing communities' readiness for hospitals' readiness for ACO development. The model is is, is complex. It includes 154 operating activities that we believe you're going to have to implement to be a certified ACO, okay? And I'll share some of that with you here in a minute. Um, but, uh, and again, the guy who wrote this is now the guy that's at CMS. So I think there's a link between what, we're, what we've done and what we're going to be doing. This is the model, and, and I, I'll quickly go through the model, and I'm sorry for those of you who can't see this uh, at, at the other location because uh, this, is, this is the ACO model. And, and remember I said you guys are at about $8,500, right? $8,500 per capita per year per Medicare recipient. Are you with me? Total expenses for everything. Part A, Part B. Are you with me? Everybody understand that? Okay? Because that's really important in the model. So you're at about $8,500. So in year zero, your starting point's about $8,500. To do an ACO that's a Medicare ACO, you'll have to have a three-year contract with Medicare, okay, as an ACO. And the way it works is uh, whoever is in this ACO, okay, their, their patients of primary care doctors will be attributed to this ACO. Say Naples has an ACO, the Naples ACO, and, and there are 200 primary care doctors in that ACO. All of their patients will then be attributed to this ACO, okay? Are you with me? Now, if my patient goes to Michigan in the summer, but gets the majority of care from me as a primary care doctor here in Naples, then I, the patient will be attributed to me. But if the patient gets the majority of their care from a, a Michigan primary care doctor, 
the, the, the patient will be attributed to that primary care doctor and that ACO, okay? It doesn't, nobody signs up except the primary care doctor, okay? Not the patients, but the patients are automatically attributed to the ACO. Are you with me so far? Does that make sense? Now, I'm, I didn't design this, but this is the, this is the rule, okay? Are, are you with me? Anybody have a question? Patient picks his own primary care. Patient picks his own primary care doctor. The other thing that, that, that's a great point, the patient can go to any specialist they want to. You know, it's not a closed panel, okay? If I'm in the Naples ACO and I'm your patient and I say, you know what, I, if I need heart surgery, I want to go to the Cleveland Clinic, I can go to the Cleveland Clinic, okay? So it's not like I'm an HMO, it's not a closed panel. You can go anywhere you want to, okay? Now, we know one thing, though. 95% of all patients go where? Yeah, exactly. Where the doctor says, where our primary care doctor says, this is where you ought to go. Ninety-five percent of all patients go there. I, I believe. You know, there, there are very few people that really, you know, do the research and say maybe I should go here. You know, uh, etc. So, so, so that's you with me so far. This is important. I'm giving you the base. Then, what you what Medicare will do, CMS, they'll create a projected spending amount for the three-year time period for Naples, and they'll say what we think. We think your costs will go up 4% a year. Let's just, uh, let's just use that as an example. So they come up with this projected curve line here over the three years that says it's going to grow at 4% a year. So your target, your projected spending target, is going to be $8,500 plus 4% per year. Whatever, that's about, say, let's say it's $10,000. So your, your projected spending here is $10,000. You, you with me so far? Then what happens is if you spend more than that, guess what happens? Anybody know? They pay for it. Yep. There's no penalty to you, except you only get fee for service. So you're going to get paid fee for service when you see the ACO patients just like you do now. Okay? And then they're going to true up, say, every quarter and compare what were your total expenditures for all those ACO patients against what you were paid. Okay? And what they paid for drugs and what they paid for hospital and what they paid for home care, total Medicare expenditures. You with me? Okay. And so if you spend more than that, nothing happens. That's why we call it, there's no downside risk. Okay, are you are with me? I was interviewed last week by a Washington paper about this because MedPAC, everybody know who MedPAC is? MedPAC, MedPAC recommended, they said, we, th we don't like this model because there's no downside risk. We think you should be penalized if you spend more than $10,000 in Naples. And I said, they said, Joe, what do you think of that? And I said, you know what, I don't agree with it. And here's why, because to set up an ACO, you're going to have to spend millions of dollars, I believe, okay? I don't see how you can possibly set up an ACO in Naples or in Lansing or in Greenville without spending millions of dollars, okay? Because of these requirements, where do you see these requirements? And, and to do that, you, you've, you've spent all this capital. Now, how are you going to recover that money? And then they want to, if, if, if MedPAC wants to penalize you above there, I, I told him it's double indemnity is the term I use. I said, that's unfair. So this reporter said, you know, that's a really good point. <laughs> you know? So he said, can I call you back on the next issue? I said, sure. So anyhow, uh, he wants to use me as his ACO expert. So, so, so if you spend less, let's say I spend 2% less. You guys spend 2% less here. If you spend 2% less, CMS keeps the 2%, okay? They keep the first 2% in cost savings, okay? Now, what if you spend only $8,000 and it's way more than 2% less, okay? The, the way the rule is written right now, you, you split it 50-50. So the ACO gets 50% and the government gets 50%, okay? So are you with me? So they true it up every quarter and look at how much money you've spent and, and, and then you, you determine, you know, whether you hit the target or, or beat the target, okay? That, that's the model in the law right now. Okay. Now, here's one of the controversies that they're debating now at the CMS headquarters in, in Washington and Baltimore. They're trying to figure out how to do this. Okay, how do you do this so it's fair to uh, Grand Rapids, Michigan? Grand Rapids, Michigan spends $6,000 a year for Medicare. McAllen, Texas spends $15,000 a year. How do you make this savings split fair to both communities? Do you see what I'm getting at? McAllen spends a lot of money should they benefit by this model? And Grand Rapids has high quality, low cost, should they be penalized by this model? So they're trying to figure out how do we do this? So, so here's an idea that I've talked with some people about 
in fact, I actually talked to uh, Max Bacchus's uh, chief health care uh, advisor, a guy by the name of Chris Daw. Uh, I was out in Billings, Montana. That's where Senator Bacchus is from. And I met with Chris. And, and what we talked about is how can we do this? Because quite honestly, Billings, Montana's expenditures are about $6,800. Okay? They're low. And so they're worried about being penalized. And they said to me, Joe, would you meet with Chris Daw from Max Bacchus's office because you understand this stuff really well and explain this to him and tell him why you can't do this. Penalize us and it'll help McAllen, Texas. And we don't want to help McAllen, Texas. Okay? And so I said, okay, well, here's the, here's the idea. Let's put a sliding scale here on the savings. So instead of the whole country splitting them 50-50, let's carve it into quartiles. The best performers like Grand Rapids and Billings, let's split it 80-20 to the hospital or the ACO, to the ACO, and have the federal government only keep 20% of this savings beyond the 2%. And if you're in the middle group, if you're in the middle quartile, let's say make it 50-50. And if you're at the McAllen, Texas side, let's make it 80-20, the government keeps 80% and McAllen, ACO keeps 20%. You with me? Do you understand the model? Does that make sense? It's kind of a way to make it a little fair, I think, because you know, 20% of $15,000 per person is a lot of money. I mean, if McAllen, Texas gets anywhere close, you know, to, to 7,800, the national average is 7,800, there's gonna be hundreds of millions of dollars in cost savings there, you know, and should they get them all, okay? So, so this is the model. Does that make sense? Any, any questions about it? Is that consistent with what you heard, or is that a little different? What, what, what do you think? Anybody? Any other models? That, 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 that's the model you know, that, that, that's being bannered about. There's no decision on it. You know, some people are lobbying, the McAllen, Texas, people at the high end are lobbying for the 50-50, okay? So, so, and I don't know what's gonna happen yet. It's, uh, I'll be in Washington next week. I'll have a better feel when I meet with, I'm actually meeting with one of the guys at CMS next week. I should have a, a better feel for what I think's gonna happen. And, you, yeah. I yeah. Uh, Premier developed a comment letter that we turned yeah. into CMS around ACOs and what we think should happen. And in that, we suggested there should be other models developed. So yeah. uh, upside, downside, yeah. risk, partial capitation, full capitation. Should, uh, if, if an ACO wants to go down that route, they should be able to. Yeah, what we think, I, and I should have added that, that there, there are about, we think there's going to be a, a set of demonstration sites that will allow full capitation. But the Medicare recipient will have to choose to join that. Like a place like Geisinger that's been doing this for 20 years we think they're going to apply and say, we'd like to do a full capitation model, a more aggressive model. We're willing to take the upside, downside risk, because we, we we've been doing this a long time. We have medical homes in place. We know how to do this stuff. And so we think about 30 sites, I think about 30 sites across the country will become capitated demonstration sites. But we think the model that will be the largest model available to the country would be the model I described a few minutes ago with the attribution. Yeah, Back there and then here. Go ahead. That's correct. That's correct. Yes. Let's say I'm a cardiologist in Miami and I like my income and I like what I'm getting from my four stress test a year. <laughs> Why in the world do I want to do this? I mean, I still have the opportunity to do my four stress test and what's my yeah. motivation? I, I think the ability to do the four stress tests is going to end. I, I, I believe we're going to have, well, part, part of the theory in all this is the development of evidence-based, national evidence-based protocols. And you know, uh, I've looked in detail at some of the cities that have that kind of use rates, and some of the practices are a little different. You know, you know, uh, and, and I think we're going to see that change. I, th I think there's going to be tremendous pressure. So, so I think that that, that that physician's probably going to have to develop a new strategy, you know, and adjust his strategy to to, to this model. And there's an estimated 30 percent markup or waste in medicine. Yeah. To fund this, this current situation. Yep. And, Physicians won't like all the, control, all the details of that, but that there is evidence for that statistically. If I were you guys, you know what, I would, I would encourage my professional society to develop the evidence-based rules. That's what I would do. Because you don't want somebody outside of your specialty telling you guys what to do. I, I, that's what I'd do. I mean, I'd say, let's get the, you know, the American College, College of Cardiology really has already criteria, you know? Yes? What about patients that are very uh, difficult to take care of, multiple very costly. Who would want them in their ICO? Yeah. How do you make sure everybody gets taken care of? Well, well the uh, attribution model is exactly that. You can't eliminate the 10 sickest patients in your practice. 
It's, it's going to be illegal, basically. So, so it, when, you, when you're the primary care doctor and I join the Naples ACO, 100% of my patients come in. I can't just keep the sickest out, okay? And, and, and there, is, there is some adjustment for acuity. There, there is an, an adjustment in acuity. I've tried to make this simple and understandable, you know, to the best of my ability, because it is very complex stuff, and I've left out the adjustment for acuity a little bit, okay? Yes? You mentioned 100% of our patients will become part of the ACO, but it's a volunteer program for our patients. Is there any, any talk about how to motivate our patients to become part of our <laughs> ACO? That, that's, you know, around the country, that's the biggest question I've heard is, is how do we build into, into place an incentive for the patient to be a part of this, to be engaged. And, and, and uh, there are some suggestions, and, and what we're suggesting to organizations like yours is start with your own employee health plan, okay? Start with, the, with the, the, your, your employee health plan and try to put those incentives in there. And there's some ideas. For example, um, you know, you, you can lower the deductible and copay to people that do certain things like get annual physicals that get into chronic disease management programs. So there's strategies you can use to kind of engage the patient in the decision-making process of making more prudent healthcare decisions about themselves. The, some places I've seen, I'll give you some examples. I, I've got one organization that has taken their employee health plan and they give employees uh, like $500 bonuses every six months if they hit their five health targets. One of them is a reduction in their BMI. If their BMI is over, over 30, if they can reduce their body mass index, and they don't have to get it to below 30, but they have to reduce it, that's one of the five. They have to make sure their screening, cancer screenings are up to date. They have to make sure they've had a physical with a full lab work once a year. So, so, so they get rewarded if their behavior is consistent with what the health plan wants them to do, okay? So, so that's how they're starting to do that. Does that, does that make sense? Is that address? Medicare, here's what Medicare has done. They have, they're eliminating all copays and deductibles from wellness checks for, for, for Medicare recipients. So annual physicals will be free. And yeah, yeah, oh, and, 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 and fee for service also. Annual physicals, will, there'll be no copay and deductible. Lab work, no copay and deductible. That's what they're proposing to do to, to, to create that same incentive. Yes? You just made a jump from Medicare to the private, private side, yep. Just want to make sure yeah. I understand what you're yeah, let me let me explain it. Because what's happening across the country, I, I call it five market segments for ACOs. Okay, there are five market segments for it's not just Medicare. People like this idea. Okay, is what I'm hearing all across the country. Here's the five market segments. First, the employees that work here and their families. That's your employee health plan is a market segment. Second major employers in the community that are, have over 200 employers, the employees. They are self-funded. They have an interest in this. Third, uh, health insurance plans, Humana, United, uh, Cigna. Cigna's been the most aggressive at using ACO principles and putting them into place in contracts around the country. Fourth, Medicaid. Many states that I'm working in are looking at budget crisis, and they're looking at how can I save money in my state? They are looking at implementing ACO-like models. And then the fifth is Medicare. So five market segments, and it's moving in all five areas right now. It depends on the state, the location. I could tell you stories about United's implementing it in bundle payments for oncology right now. I can tell you that all the, these principles are being used because people see it as a way to save money, and they're willing to share the savings with the providers. Are being used, but yep. there's no statutory requirement or law that states that this is only for Medicare. Right, that's right. Correct? That's correct. That's correct. Now, now, the, the, oh, the law only the, the the law only guides this for Medicare, so nobody else has to do this. But what they're saying is this makes sense. This is a chance for my company. I was with in, in on the East Coast a couple months ago, a major shipbuilder, 10,000 employees. They said, you know what, this is a great model. They went to two PHOs, large hospital PHOs, and said, we'll give you this deal, the same deal, starting January 1st for our 10,000 employees. And we want to implement this. So, I mean, nobody made them do it. It's not the law. But they said, you know what, we like this. We will save money. We'll share the money with you. And let's implement it January 1st, 2011. They are implementing this in three weeks, okay? 
And that's, that's how this thing's moving, folks. It, I think on the private side, it's moving faster than the government side. Yes? Large percentage of the Medicare money is spent in the patient's last 30 days that's of life. Last six that's months. Actually, last six months. Yep. Um, is this being addressed either on the liability side? Because now yeah. we've got the incentive not to treat to save money. How is that going to be handled in the future? Yep. And, 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 and I think the liability side is a weakness. I think we... I really encourage people, we have to address the medical liability side. But if you, you know, think about medical liability. If you use evidence-based practices, the chances of you being sued go down, not up. Okay, number one. And number two, on the end-of-life issues, you know, I've looked at your end-of-life. There's a great database that you guys could look at and look at your end-of-life costs in Naples. It's called the Dartmouth Atlas, okay? If you go online, you, you know, if, you're, if you have some free time on a weekend or something, go online, Dartmouth Atlas, one word, dot org, O-R-G, okay? Dr. John Wenberg developed this model at Dartmouth, and it has every Medicare patient in the United States in the model. So you can compare Naples to other cities, and you can look, and I've done this, I, I do this for a living, so I do it. I looked at you guys, and I looked at your end-of-life cost compared to the national average, and you're not bad. You, compared to the national average, you, you guys are actually a little lower. You're in about the 45th percentile if 50th is average, okay? And, and it, w here's the kind of things we look at. How many patients were admitted? How many days of ICU care did you have in your last six months of life? We look at how many physician visits did you have in your last six months of life. All that data is in this Dartmouth Atlas you can look at. Now, now, I think it has to be a community culture change. Now, I've been in cities in the United States in the last six months that have had really high end-of-life costs. And, and what I've advised them to do is look at the places that are doing it lower. There's communities that are doing a really great job, and they're not getting sued because what they're doing is it's a cultural issue. They're talking to families about advanced directives. The churches get a, an educational program in synagogues in the community on advanced directives. Th there's things you can do to, to really address this. Yeah. Question? Well, um, I'm, I'm concerned that the guidelines are out of date and in fact harmful to people. I'm, I'm a general, full-time general interest. Okay. For example, the diabetes guidelines, they end up with older people having hypoglycemic episodes mental confusion, falling, breaking their hip, domino theory. We've got to change these guidelines yep. to get them in line with what is real. Now, I've, I've reached out to my organizations, to ACP, mm -hmm. the national organization, yep. and they don't even call me back. What can we do to get realistic guidelines? The guidelines right now are set up to favor mm -hmm. uh, proprietary things, yep. you know, lab tests, yep. tests, and so forth. Well, how can that be addressed? I, I, I would, I would I think the, the greatest power comes from multiple people. So, so here, I think if you can organize people here, and maybe people like Alan, who's, Alan's very influential on a national level. He's got a lot of connections, at, uh, you know, and, and, and Premier does too. If you would educate us, we, we have a full-time lobbying staff in Washington. Our job is to really help you. You know, we serve our, you know, and I, I, tell, I told Alan when I came here, my job is to serve you. And, and if you guys identify those kind of issues, we'll follow up and help you. That's our job. Our job is to help you be successful. That's what we want to do. Yes? Have they done national evaluations to see the areas that are way above the 50% mean and their liability problems to compare to see if those cities are target focused? Yeah, yeah. They have, and they're, they're, they're not. The high cost cities. Uh, it's, there's not a correlation to liability right now. It, it's re you know what the biggest correlation? I, I hate to say it. Who owns different Who owns facilities? I hate to say. It, it shows that in any city, I, I've seen the research. If it's, if we have a lot of physician-owned entities, okay, surgery centers, diagnostic centers, you have about a 20% increase in volume. Okay, that that's the number one determinant, not liability. Yep. So how do they manage the Stark Law then? You mean the current, you mean yeah, I mean, if a physician, I mean, if they own the facility and they have a higher uh, referral percentage or procedures, how do they get through the start line? I'm not sure. I'm not sure how they're doing it. But, you know, you know in, in general, you know, you, there, there are certain rules, and I'm sure they're trying to follow the rules about who owns what share of that entity, because they're, they're there are rules that if you own a smaller share, you know, so say a lot, you know, I was in a city where there were three physician-owned hospitals down in Louisiana, and, uh, and, and uh, they were all attached to, two of the three were attached to ambulatory surgery centers. They were 20-bed surgical hospitals attached to ambulatory surgery centers. 
And you know, the, the, law, the laws in this basically said we're freezing all that, no new ones of these, no growth in ownership, and, and, and the law is really to move away from this, move away from physician-owned entities. That, that, because of the research, the research is not, I'm not making that research up, it's national research. Uh, and, and, and they've said maybe that's not a good idea to have physicians own ambulatory surgery centers, to own diagnostic centers, we, maybe that's not a good idea based on the volume, okay? If you look at the Dartmouth Avenue yeah. in Naples, anything that's physician owned in this town, we're at the 90th percentile. Surgical services, lab, x-ray, really? physician services. The average is low because of um, nursing home care, DME, things like that. So our average looks okay. Okay, but so yeah. we're really just as bad in the town, yeah. right, in physician owned. In this health care reform debate, why did they not make it so that doctors can only make money off E and M codes and procedure codes? You know, why yeah. do doctors make money off PET scans, selling chemotherapy, radiation therapy, all this lab, x-ray, everything like that. It would change things overnight yeah. as far as sending that cost curve. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, philosophically, you're probably right, but I think politically it didn't, you know, you, and it was a political process. I mean, unfortunately, you know, I think you and I and others know, well, here's the logic of what we ought to do, but politically it's not as easy to accomplish. And, and I think what one of the the, the thoughts about this is this helps us move, it, move, move the cost curve in an evolutionary way and gives people a chance to sell those entities and to, you know, to, to, to change behavior over time. I think that's the theory. Let's give people a chance to change. You know, let's not just slam, a, slam it. You know? I, I think that was the theory. And, and whether we agree or disagree, I think that's what they're trying to do. Yeah, I agree. I agree. And, you know, unless there's some cuts and uh, what's paid for those yeah. services, yeah. the spending's going to stay the same. Yep. Uh, unless there's full capitalization. Well, right, right. In, unless the... It's not going to be well received by the patients yep. uh, who are not going to want to be a physician who is incentivized not to give care. Yep. Uh, I was in Detroit during the HMO days, yep. and uh, that was poorly received yep. uh, back then. I, and Medicare patients may be stuck. I think this is an evolution decapitation is the way I look at this. That, that's why they're doing it. It's a political solution towards capitation, I think. That, that's my read of it. Yes? Is there any talk about changes to the like, regional-based reimbursement for Medicare? Yes, there is. There, there is. And that's, that's the other part I didn't go through in the details. There is a debate about that right now, about how do we address the regional differences in payment, like in wage index for hospitals, payment for physicians, that, that is being debated right now also. And, and there's not, clear rules are not written yet, but that, that is an issue. And I, I, I kind of, to try to keep it simple, I didn't go into that level of detail, but you're right. Okay. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Do they plan on having the Medicare recipient have a little more skin in the game, you know, from the standpoint of, of cost to them and helping in utilization. Because right now, if yeah. you have a supplementary plan, they can hop doctor to doctor, test yeah. to test, it's free. Yeah. That, that's the challenge. And, and what, here's their hope. Their hope is if we can get every Medicare recipient in the United States into a medical home, okay, that the one medical home, you know, that's number one. The, the goal is to get every Medicare recipient into one medical home and build that relationship with the medical home. And, and what we mean by medical home is, is, is really beyond not only the primary care physician, but nurse practitioners, PAs, medical social workers who deal with chronically depressed patients. Okay, so, so it's the, the whole gamut of caregivers that are under the supervision of a primary care physician. Th those people work for the primary care physician. And, and the goal is that they would then influence that patient to behave in a manner that's more consistent with what, what we all would like to see happen. That, that's the theory. The medical home is a foundation of ACO development, okay? And, and I'll go into our model in a minute if you, if, but I think it's more important to have this discussion because these are great questions. Yes, sir. From a premier point of view, the town of Naples is 300,000 people with a substantial transient population. Yeah. What would be the ideal number of ACOs? Boy, it's a good question. Maybe, maybe one or maybe two, probably, is, is, you know, my gut. I mean, I've not finished our assessment yet. That's what we're going to work on today. But maybe one, maybe two, I, I'm not sure. Um, not, not more than that, I don't think, would make it financially, would be my... So you, how many patients would you think would be the best to make an ACO succeed? Oh, 1, I, 200, I, I think you, the larger the group, 
the more predictability you'll have in the cost. You, you know? uh, now, in the law, the minimum number in the law is 5,000. Okay? And, 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 and in this model, they said the minimum number of people we need in this is 5,000. But I've seen Medicare's, I've seen CMS's actuarial projections in the last uh, three months. And they've, they, they, they wrote this before they did that. And here's what the actuarial shows. The actuarial show that at 2%, at 2% to predict cost reasonably within one standard deviation, you need 15,000 lives. That's what the actuaries show. Okay? So, so Medicare underestimated the number of lives that they need to make this actuarially predictable. Okay? And, and so now they're saying, uh-oh, we made a mistake. And at, and, and at 5,000 lives, the actuaries show uh, so one standard deviation is plus or minus 4% in cost. So what, what I'm wondering is will the final regs, instead of this being 2%, if you only have 5,000 lives, I'm wondering if this will be 4%, meaning the government keeps the four, first 4%. Because now they understand this, they now understand the actuarial projections, and they're saying, uh-oh, we don't want to pay people a bonus, you know, <coughs> if, it's, if it happens by luck, <laughs> you, you know? And, and that's, so, so they're beginning to rethink that. Uh, so, so at, at, at 5,000 lives, one standard deviation is plus or minus 4%. At 10,000 lives, it's 3%. And at 15,000 lives, it's 2%. Based upon 2009 Medicare actual expenditures in the United States. Okay, so I, I, I saw the report. Any other, any other questions before I go on? Okay, yes, sir. My concern would be, who gets to keep the shared savings? If the hospital runs the ACO, are they going to keep the money? Or I, I, think, I think it has to be, in fact, the law basically says you've got to form a group made up of physicians and hospitals to decide that. You guys got to decide that. You have to be at the table and participate in that decision. So you got to be there, I, I think. You guys got to decide that. You guys got to sit down together as a, as a group, you know, a group of physicians and a hospital and say, okay, how are we going to divide up these savings so everybody has skin in the game and everybody's incentivized to move in the dir same direction? You guys got to do that, okay? There's not a prescriptive answer to that, okay? So, so, but you, you got to be at the table, I think, okay? And I've told Alan that. I said, you got to have these guys, at the, men and women at the table, to be successful. You got to be aligned. You got to be working together. You guys have a great opportunity here. You, you got a great hospital, a great medical community. You have a great opportunity here, I think. So it's really exciting. You're better off than, not, I've done 20 of these. You're better off than 90% of them right now. So you, you got a lot going for you. So use it to your advantage. Don't screw it up. Work together. I think you got a great chance to, to be very successful in this. How much on, on the shared savings? Everybody's thinking about, many people are talking about, you know, what are you going to get? I mean, how much, how many dollars are there going to be there? Is, is there going to be enough to motivate anybody to yeah. do anything? Or is it going to be, if you are even going to be a participator, yeah. You have to just be a better practitioner yeah. even to be in the group. Probably both eventually, I think. But let, let's, let's play around with the numbers. I don't, I don't think the dollars are going to be enough. Well, th think about it. Let's say we have 100,000 people in our, yes. for a minute, yeah. and we save $1,000 per person, right? What, how much money is that, y'all? 100,000 people, $100,000. That's like $100 million, isn't it? Boy, that's a lot of money. A hundred million dollars? But it's still a lot less than what they get now. So yeah. you're using yeah. it as a carrot and stick. Stick, yeah. And yep. you're talking about the carrot, you're not talking about the stick. stick the yeah. stick has to come in. The stick is the utilization, right? Lower number of procedures, if you're a procedurist, right? I mean, that, that's the issue. So you, you may want to think, how can we offset the lost income to the procedurist if they're doing fewer procedures? But that's a lot of money to play around with, right? I mean, a hundred million dollars. I mean, that's... Let's say it's even half that. Say, say it's half of that, $50 million. You know, so, so, so I think you've got to sit down as a team and run those numbers, I think. You know? uh, we, we haven't done that yet. You know, we're trying to help you assess, number one, what do you have to do to become an ACO here? You know, that's what we're trying to help uh, the, the organization identify. And, and by, tom by this afternoon, we're going to give you a preliminary report that says, our best judgment, based on all we know today, here, here's our best thoughts about how, what you ought to do, okay? I, I guess what I was trying to say is my point mm -hmm. is on an individual level from yeah. an individual person. Person, yeah. Is it $500 or well, 5000 I, I don't know. Yeah. My, my gut feeling is these numbers are So not, small, yeah. yeah. I don't I know. Don't, I think people are worried about, you know, 
who's going to take what from whom, and mm -hmm. hospital and physician, yep. when I think the picture seems to be bigger than that. Yep. L let's get, I, I think you've got to break it down. You've got to get the facts for your situation. I think it's a good question. That's the next level of detail I think you need to do, do you need to get. I don't, I don't think that's an illegitimate question. I think it's legitimate, but let's get through the model. Does this make sense? Now let's go to the next level. What's the real financials? We, we, we should do that, and we'll, we'll help do that. Vicki will do that. Yeah. If the goal is to have every Medicare patient be in one medical home or mm -hmm. healthcare that's the goal of the organization, what do you do with communities like Naples in which half of the year they spend it in yep. whatever that's a tough question and the government is, is dealing with it what, what, the, what they're still the theory still is is the medical home would be the place where the person gets the majority of their care and, and then you know I, I think the, the next best thing is going to be communicating with that person that gives them the other piece of that care that's the best they've come up with thus far and, and they're struggling with that, you know, and, and, and you, that, but that's a real issue here. And, and I, I think the best thing you can do is try to build a communication link between the two providers, the two the physicians here and the physician in Michigan or Ohio, wherever it is, okay. But the point is yep. that there is a common healthcare organization or medical home mm -hmm. in the north. Or yep, where sure. They come from. Okay. Um, then ultimately that accountable care organization is going to receive the benefits because that's where they're enrolled. Right. And there would have to be a whole lot of um, relationships or understanding that for the time that they come down to Naples, if we add to this, the shared savings, then what does Naples get for that? Yeah. Or, or if you spend more, you, you know, yeah, you see what I mean? Because um, in reality, if, I, if, I'm that, if I'm that primary care physician in Ohio and I have a lot of my patients that come to Naples, and, you know, but fortunately, because of the tax laws, I think the majority of people I perceive make Florida their home base, right? I mean, six months one day because of the lack of an income tax in Florida versus Ohio. I mean, at least the people that, you know, I, I've been, I've spent the weekend here with a couple of friends of mine, GM, a GM exec who's retired, and he's made Florida his base. He goes to Michigan to his cottage in the summer, but Florida is his primary base. So I, I perceive that more people do that than have Michigan as their base and Florida's their second home. Okay. These are some of the rules we've talked about already. Um, you know, hospitals and physicians need to be working together. That's the, the way the model is set up. Uh, pro the program begins, here's the way it works. The earliest you can apply to become a Medicare certified, just, you know, in those five markets, just Medicare, is May of 2011. That's the earliest you can apply. And the earliest you can begin is, is January 2012, except for <laughs> There are 19 organizations in the United States who are lobbying CMS right now to become grandfathered ACOs, okay? And so I, well, what I'm hearing, in fact, Seth, have we heard today yet whether they're in? We think we're going to hear this week, and we think there's a higher probability than not that they are going to be grandfathered. The 19 organizations include the 10 physician groups that were in the demonstration site, and we're giving Alan the report on those 10 sites. I don't know if you're familiar with those 10 sites, but there have been a three-year um, uh, pilot of 10 sites in the United States, five group 10 group practices, multi-specialty group practices. Five of them have done really well, millions of dollars in distributions, and five uh, basically just got fee-for-service. And y you can see why some did and some didn't, okay? Uh, so, so, so that's available. That'll be, that we'll give that to Alan. Uh, that report and he can share it with you if you'd like it. Um, so, because we, we believe in being transparent, I think Alan does also, and then we've talked about this. He says, Joe, just share with our physicians everything you shared with us because we want to be transparent. And, that, and that's the right way to be, I think. So, so I hope that's helpful. Um, the, the, so the 19 are lobbying to become in, and that's the earliest you can apply. Um, and again, uh, the pay payment models go beyond fee-for-service. We talked about capitation earlier. Uh, the, there, there, is a, there is a rule in the law that says we wanna, we'll give preference to ACOs that have developed private relationships also. So that's why some people are moving ahead with private relations right, right now. And, and it's happening pretty, pretty rapidly. Um, an example I'll give you, uh, Columbus, Ohio, home of Ohio State. Children's Hospital in Columbus has developed three years ago this model where they have a contract with the state Medicaid program to capitate 500,000 children in central Ohio and they're making money on it doing well 
And what they've done is they formed a super PHO with all the pediatricians in Central Ohio, and they get the capitation, they distribute it, and, and, they, and they share it, share the savings, okay? So, so this stuff works. Um, over 10, oh, the, this is a number that I, I find amazingly low. The projection said by the, Congre the CBO that we're gonna save $4.9 billion over 10 years. I think this is really low. I was in a one community and I did the rough calculations on the back of a napkin and if that community got down to the 7,800 national average, it was $200 million a year per year going on in that community alone and I, I think this number is way low because if we really create alignment related to utilization, I think the savings will be in the hundreds of billions of dollars in my personal opinion. And then the model does allow, the law does allow the creation of special pediatric ACOs, okay? And we actually are working with some folks in Atlanta. Here's the premier model I want to share with you real quickly. The model includes six key core components. So the 154 operating activities that we've developed fit into these six areas, okay? And so we've gone, yesterday we went through all 154 with Phil, right Phil? <laughs> in detail. And we, what I tried to do is explain, here's what we mean by that operating activity. Here's how you can implement it. And so we went through it step by step. The first one is called patient-centered foundation. What that really means is we want to keep the patient at the center of a continuum of care. That's what that means. We want a continuum of care. And you don't have to own all the continuum of care. You can contract with hospice or home care. But what you want to do is you want to build ACO principles into the contract. And I'll, I'll show you some ACO principles in a minute. Uh, second is the health home. People call it the medical home. Premier calls it the health home. Health home because the goal is to keep people healthy. And second, it's, it's a health home that is, it's a team of people that includes the nurse practitioner, the PA, the medical social worker, supervised by the primary care doctor. Uh, the third is the high value network. And what we mean by that is across this continuum, you gotta connect all these things. So you have like an electronic record and that you also manage cost and quality across the continuum, okay? Not just at the hospital, not just at the practice, but how do we work together? That's what we mean by how value network. People, health data management, what we mean by that is doing things like um, in your population, like the popul if your first population is the employee health plan, how many diabetics do we have in the employee health plan? And how are, we being how are we treating those diabetics? How many of them are following our protocols that we've designed here locally? <laughs> and, and you know, like, uh, are they getting A1Cs quarterly? Whatever your rule, you know, whatever your guidelines call for. So uh, we try to measure that. And the fifth is ACO leadership. I, I really believe, and, and I've said this to Alan uh, privately and publicly, the key to success is really involved, engaged physician leaders. This will not work without physicians heavily involved on the front end leading this effort. And, and one of our recommendations is you've got to get more physician leaders involved here in Naples to be successful. That's our recommendation. I, I know he knows I'm going to say that and he has authorized me to, to be transparent with you. You've got to have physicians engaged together with you to be successful. You can't do it alone. Uh, and, and, and it's going to involve training physicians, deploying physicians as leaders, paying them as leaders. You know, people aren't going to do this stuff for nothing. And, and you also need leadership in other areas, you know, the actuarial area. You're going to need some advice from an actuary because you want to manage risk. You're, you're going to need legal advice because of the antitrust rules. You know, there, there's different pieces of it that I could get into, but we don't have time to go into that level of detail. And then the last area, when you think about this, who has the data? to measure the cost of all of these things to the patient, right? It, it, right now, the only places in general are insurers, right? Your PHO may have that data. You know, we talked to Kathy a lot about that idea. Does the PHO here, through their TPAs, have the ability to measure the cost per capita to the patient for all these areas? Because if you think about it, who else, can, who else knows what, how many prescriptions are filled at CVS and what the costs are? What's the cost to the patient for every specialist they see? Who can pull that data together? Because to do this successfully, you have to have that data accurate, real-time, transparent, okay? So, so we call that payer partnerships, okay? So those are the six components of it. If we go on, any questions about our model? Okay, the, the other thing is we've tried to build this model on the triple aim. Triple aim was developed by the IHI. Don Berwick was at the IHI. In fact, I kind of, I, I joke with people that this is funny. This used to be called the IHI triple aim, okay? And Alan's been an advocate of triple aim, I know, for several years. But now Don Berwick, who's the director at CMS, he calls this 
the Medicare AAA. <laughs> and we believe, and, and we've done this, these principles are all integrated into our model because we know Don Berwick's going to integrate them into the ACL model. And so is Rick Gilfill, and I know Rick really well, and, and I know he's going to integrate this in, into the model. And, I, and what this is is three points. It's, it's looking at population health using things like HEDIS, metri HEDIS measurement, quality measurement tools, health status, mortality. Quest is the name of Premier's quality measurement tool that we use. Uh, and then second, per capita cost, looking at your population. Like again, looking at the employee health plan here. How much do we spend on drugs? How, mu how many admissions per thousand? How many readmissions are we getting in our employee health? Those are the things we'll be looking at, you'll be looking at. And then, and then the other metrics on the quality side, it, we call it experience of care. We look at things, do patients get in to see a doctor timely? Do they get their referral timely? Uh, are their patients satisfied with the care? Okay, those are the three legs of the triple aim, okay? We can go on. Now, what we've done then is develop these these six, these six areas that I mentioned, and then we've developed capabilities, and then the 154 operating activities. And so what you've done, what, what your team here at, at Naples have done over the last couple of weeks is they've done a self-grading of how we're doing here on the 154 activities, okay? And so they've done a self-assessment, and I've helped them define what the tools are, you know, our team here, Seth and I, and so this afternoon we're gonna roll out a report, if we can go on to the next page, um, that, that'll, that we have a computer model, a software model that'll generate a report for us in what we call these capability framework. Go on to the next page. And we'll give them, we'll give you all kind of a, a, a spider diagram in all six of those areas and then a seventh spider that's a total for the whole thing. And you'll see how you guys have rated yourself in these six categories. How ready are you to proceed? Okay, go on to the next one. Uh, these are the members of the readiness collaborative that you're a part of. You can see you're down here, NCH, and, and there's, there, there's about, uh, this is an old diagram. This is, this is our map as of October 15th in the report, Seth, if we can get the new one in. And, and we, we're adding people every week. This is about 48. We're now at 56 organizations that are in this collaborative with you. So you have access to a lot of information from all these places. So these are the organizations that are saying, let's assess whether we should and what, how we should develop an ACO. You're one of those, okay. The other group, can I show the next map? These are 24, soon to be 25 uh, next week, that have already said, we're going ahead, we're going full speed ahead, we're implementing an ACO. And, and so the memorial down here in, uh, where's that, Fort Lauderdale? The, they're one of the 24 that have said, we're going full speed ahead, we're implementing this, we've already made that decision and commitment. The other organizations include Geisinger, SUMA, and, and, I've, and I've shared with uh, Alan which of these organizations look like you the most, which organizations are the most advanced, like Fairview, SUMA. So if you want to learn from some of these places, you can talk to people there. And, and Alan has all these graphs, and, and I, I think he's going to make them available to everybody so you have a chance to study them and talk to people. Does that make sense? Are you with me? So today we're going to give him the report. It's a preliminary report. We go back and I turn it into a peer, we have a peer review program at Premier, so my peers will review my work and our work here, and they'll critique it, make some changes, hopefully minor, <laughs> and then in two and a half weeks we'll give Alan a final report on what we've done here. And the final report will include two things. Uh, one is, uh, I always try to come up with, what are the five things I would do right now to get ready? What would I do? And, and, and last night I put the draft together about 11 o'clock and it's six, so it's six right now. I'll try to get to five. And, and then the second thing we're gonna give you is if you wanna become a CMS certified ACO, what are the 46 things you gotta do between now and then? Because it is complicated. And we're gonna give him that with timetables and steps. So we give you both of those, okay? So does that make sense? Again, we're here to help you. We think you got a great place. You're, you're ahead of most places in my opinion. I've done 20 of these. Uh, I'd put you in the first quartile, okay? And, and what you have to develop this. Now, you haven't connected all the dots yet. That's your weakness. The strength is you got a lot of good things here in place already. It's a good place, really good place. I wouldn't say that in Miami. I wouldn't say that in certain other cities, okay? <laughs>